Okay, uh, so today we're going to uh, first talk about um, uh, the main lecture on amino acids. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a primer about how our lectures, the flow of how our lectures are going to go. Um, so uh, in every single lecture topic, uh, we're going to provide uh, some type of clinical relevance, either clinical or translational relevance. Uh, one thing I'm going to do is in the ECM lecture, I'm, I'm refitting that a little bit, uh, and we're going to focus on regenerative medicine. So most of the topics will be human diseases, and in that case, we're going to do a little bit of a sidestep and look at some uh, translational medicine bioengineering approaches. Uh, but essentially, each of the lectures will start with an introduction to some type of disease state or translational application. We're then going to work through whatever the course material is, uh, the details of cell and molecular biology that uh, in that particular case are relevant to that disease. And then we're going to always end the lecture by trying to readdress that clinical application, that disease state, with the new information that we've given you. Why did what we tell you, how is that important to understanding the disease, okay? So the idea is to try to give you guys a little bit of context that we're not just up here preaching, uh, we're not just reading out of Albert's Bible of, of cell and molecular biology, but a lot of the stuff that we're teaching, all of the stuff that we're teaching is, is critical in, uh, in human disease and your understanding uh, of it, okay? So today we're going to talk uh, about sickle cell disease uh, and the role amino acids and protein structure uh, play in the evolution of that disease or in the ideology of that disease. So the main course, uh, the main lecture objectives for today are first to review very quickly uh, some of what we've done in the pre-lecture, go through some amino acids. We're going to talk about different kinds of um, bonds, uh, covalent bonds, non-covalent bonds that help drive protein structure. We're gonna talk a lot about how we describe protein structure uh, and try to give you an idea of how protein structure impacts its function, okay? Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the evolutionary constraints and trajectories. Like I'd mentioned in the introductory lecture, uh, it's important for you guys to try to get into the mode of thinking about why things are the way they are currently, right? Uh, so there are evolutionary pressures, there are environmental pressures on us, on our proteins, on all of our systems that are driving us to become more and more optimal systems, uh, essentially. And so throughout the term, uh, you'll find that we're going to touch on these sort of evolutionary constraints uh, and selective pressure uh, in, in deciding some of these uh, biological trajectories. And finally, we're going to talk a bit about the ideology of uh, sickle cell disease. Um, if you guys don't remember from the pre-lecture, uh, when we talk about the ideology, we're really talking about the cause of the disease, okay? Uh, just to remind you, um, throughout these lectures, uh, the slides are color-coded. Blue are terms that we expect you to know, okay? All right, so what is sickle cell disease? Uh, it's a recessive inherited blood disorder. It's caused by a single mutation a single amino acid substitution in the hemoglobin beta chain gene, okay? So when we talk about a recessive uh, inherited disorder, what we're talking about is uh, a disorder that it's required that you inherit both that mutation from your mother and your father, okay? If you inherit one from your mother and one from your father, you will not get the disease. It's only when uh, you inherit uh, the same mutation from both parents. Uh, a dominant inherited disorder is when it only requires you to inherit one disordered or mutated gene and you'll get the disease, okay? Recessive versus dominant. When we talk about gene structure, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some nomenclature. As you can imagine, uh, there's a race to discover new genes, there's a race to discover new proteins, uh, and all of us that are egomaniacs in the lab like to name things after ourselves, right? I have a cat named Ninja. I'm waiting for him to discover a protein and call it the Ninja protein, right? Which has probably already been named. So, uh, so you can imagine as there's a race to name things, right? There becomes a lot of confusion about what on earth you're talking about. Because you may discover the exact same gene and call it something completely different from me. And in your manuscripts, you're calling it, 
you know, the Fred gene, and in my papers I'm calling it the Tom gene, right? And no one knows what's going on. And so there's a collection by the community to establish a standard nomenclature when we name genes, okay? And when we name genes, they have a three-letter designation. Uh, the genes will always, so if you're reading a manuscript and you see three letters and they're italicized, that is indicative of a gene, okay? So that tells you it's a gene. In this particular case, we're talking about the human gene, so all the letters are capitalized. But if you're looking at, if you're reading a paper uh, and they were referencing a mouse gene, the first letter would be capitalized and the others would be lowercase, okay? So that's just a note about, about some nomenclature. All right, so what are the symptoms of, um, of hemoglobin, uh, excuse me, of sickle cell disease? So one, which is the most obvious when we look at, uh, here's a picture of normal red blood cells and sickle-celled erythrocytes or red blood cells, is this gross morphological change in the shape of the cell, okay? And we're gonna talk about what is driving that change in the shape. Functionally, what happens is your normal erythrocytes or red blood cells are relatively flexible and deformable and what that allows them to do is to squeeze through very small capillaries, let's say in the lung or in the kidney um, or in the tips of your fingers where, um, where your vessels get very, very small. Uh, the, the, plas the elasticity uh, of these red blood cells allows them to squeeze through. Uh, in sickle cell disease, you get this erythrocyte that is this sickle shape, almost looks like a banana. Uh, and it becomes exceptionally rigid. And what that doesn't allow for it to do is deform and morph into the vessels and travel through the vessels. And so what happens is a lot of times they'll get clogged uh, in, in vessels. Uh, they'll, they'll burst, right, and release their contents, uh, release hemoglobin and iron. Uh, as a consequence, you get, uh, you get a syndrome known as anemia, right? So anemia is low red blood count. That's what that means. You can generate things like acute chest syndrome. So again, I just mentioned that your vessels in the lung are very, very small as they wrap around your alveolar structures. Uh, and you can get a lot of damage in the lung due to these rigid sickle-shaped cells getting clogged, disrupting uh, the vessel walls. Uh, these patients also um, uh, suffer from frequent infections. These are opportunistic bugs that um, love the iron in your, in your blood. And so when you're releasing hemoglobin and releasing the iron from red blood cells, uh, these, um, these opportunistic infections can take off. Uh, and the final is this uh, uh, dactylitis, dactylitis, excuse me, uh, which is essentially inflammation in your digits, in your fingers, in your toes, okay? All right. So when we talk about prevalence and incidence, I just want to make a real quick note here. When we talk about prevalence, we're really talking about how many people are affected, okay? So in the case of sickle cell disease, bless you over there. <laughs> um, in the case of sickle cell disease, prevalence is about 90,000 to 100,000 cases in the United States. When we talk about incidence, we're really talking about a probability statement. How likely is it for someone to get this disease. And in this case, the incidence is about one in 500 African-American births. Uh, African-Americans will, uh, will end up with sickle cell disease, okay? We'll talk a little bit at the end about why this particular population of people are susceptible to this disease. Okay. So let's march into proteins. So from the pre-lecture, uh, you learned that peptides are linear chains of amino acids. They're strung together through amide bonds. You might also see the word peptide bond. Amide bond and peptide bonds are the same thing, okay? These amide bonds form between amino acids uh, through a reaction between their amine group uh, and their carbo carboxylic acid group, okay? All this was covered in the pre-lecture, but I want to review it again today. When you're reading a peptide structure, if I ask you what's the sequence of the peptide, you always read from the N-terminus to the C-terminus. 
like when you're reading from left to right in your books, okay? N terminus on the left, C terminus on the right. N terminus is identified by this primary amine that's hanging off the end of the polypeptide. The C terminus is defined by the carboxy, carboxylic acid on the other end. Um, yep, okay. All right, number two fact that you need to remember is that the peptide bond is both rigid and planar. Again, uh, we went through this in the pre-lecture, but this is due to the sharing of this double bond between the oxygen and this nitrogen at, uh, at this peptide bond. And so as a consequence, this structure here is rigid. However, our polypeptides, our proteins are not all linearly rigid rods, right? They have shape. They have, some are globular, some are rod-like, but they all have some type of three-dimensional shape. And the reason is that there's torsional flexibility around this alpha carbon, okay? Both between the alpha carbon and the carboxyl group and the alpha carbon and that amine group, okay? So that protein, that amino acid, that polypeptide can twist around those bonds. Okay, protein sequence is gonna be conserved and customized throughout evolution. So now we're gonna start talking about how we describe protein structure. The first that we're gonna talk about is that of a primary structure. This is like me saying, read the letters of the words that are in a sentence, right? The first letter is, the second letter is, the third letter is, right? So in this case, the primary structure um, is, let's say, meth um, methionine, valine, histidine, right? Um, and when we do what we call a sequence alignment, so we're gonna align the first amino acids of this protein. This happens to be the protein encoded by the HBB gene. Here you see it starts with the methionine. Here's the human sequence, and we're gonna write out its primary sequence. This is the first 60 amino acids of that protein. Here's the macaque, it's a monkey. Uh, we've got mouse, crocodile, right? And if we line up all these different species and the HBB gene of those species, we can begin to talk about how well conserved that protein is. How well across evolution are certain amino acids in certain positions retained, okay? So for instance, uh, we can look at this um, uh, glutamic acid right here. And we see across all of these species that glutamic acid is conserved. What that tells me as a biologist is that glutamic acid is probably pretty dang important because crocodiles have it, monkeys have it, mice have it, we have it. So it must be pretty important, okay? And so we want you guys to begin to think about, think about things in this way, right? When you see patterns, patterns usually mean something when it, when it comes to evolution. So let's take a look at, at this amino acid position here. And here you can see that there's a very low level of conservation of that amino acid position across species. And so we might infer from that 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 might be less critical uh, than some of the more conserved, uh, conserved amino acids. So when we talk about conservation of proteins, we're talking about how well the sequence, the primary sequence of that protein is perpetuated throughout evolution. And we would give it, when we're doing an, an analysis of conservation, we would say it's 85% conserved, which means 85% of the amino acids are the same in the same positions between, let's say, mouse and human, right? Between whichever species I'm, I'm exploring. The other thing that happens through evolution is that of customization of protein sequence. Uh, yeah. And so in this case, what we're looking at is the HBB gene again. And you see that what can happen during replication, during um, cell division, during generation of offspring, is that throughout this process, uh, we can wind up picking up additional copies of a gene and those additional copies can incur certain types of mutations. Mutations are great for evolution, and they're also bad for evolution, right? So, uh, and we'll talk about that here in the very end. 
there's a specific mutation in sickle cell disease that gives a promotive effect. It's a gain of function mutation. It confers an ability on a population that the rest of us don't have, but it also has a negative consequence, right? So there are positive and negatives to mutations that are occurring throughout evolution. In this case, in the case of uh, the hemoglobin gene, you can see that what happens is that within humans, we have evolved various isoforms of the same gene. And what this allows us to do is generate proteins that have very specific functions, might actually perform slightly different functions and become specialized in a process. Okay. So, I'm gonna flash this up again. It was on the pre-lecture. The point is not to memorize structure. Uh, the point is to really begin to get a handle on uh, the classes of amino acids uh, that, that exist, okay? I'm gonna, my tendency is to wanna go to the screen, but I wanna use the mouse, so you'll see me going back and forth. I apologize for that. All right, so for instance, right, we have classifications of amino acids where we have charged side chains. They might be positive, they might be negative, right? We have amino acids, which are polar and yet do not have charge. We have these special cases, and we have hydrophobic side chains, okay? So think about them in, their cl in these classifications. It's these side chain chemical characteristics, positive charge, negative charge, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, that are gonna begin to drive how those polypeptides begin to take a type of shape as these side chains begin to uh, interact with one another. Okay, so let's talk about then, we've talked about the primary structure. There's no structural information in there other than the linear sequence, right? So let's talk about now three-dimensional shape and how those things take shape. All right, so we're gonna call this the protein folding problem, right? Which is how do you go from a linear chain of amino acids into a stable functional protein. And I have to tell you, there are a lot of folks that spend a lot of time trying to build computer algorithms to predict protein structure, three-dimensional structure, based on the primary sequence. And they are awful. <laughs> They're absolutely awful at predicting three-dimensional structure. Um, very simple proteins, very small proteins, they're pretty good at. As the proteins become more and more complex, the, the cell actually has machinery that help to shape the protein uh, in the early stages, right? Which are processes that are just quite difficult uh, to actually begin to predict. But there are at the very small scales, right? At the very small scales, we can begin to make some, uh, develop some understanding of, of how amino acids are, are shaping proteins. So here we have our polypeptide chain, and we're trying to figure out how on earth does it go from that linear chain into this folded protein. Today we're also going to talk a little bit about some ulterior views. So there are multiple ways to view protein structure, uh, and I'll highlight that a little bit as we go. So I'm going to focus first on the special, uh, the special side chains, and in particular, we're gonna focus on this amino acid, cysteine. So cysteine is special in the sense that it has this thiol group, this sulfhydryl group that's hanging off the end. The interesting thing about this thiol group is that it winds up becoming a bit of a redox sensor. Uh, it can sense the redox potential in the environment, okay? Um, and so, so what we find is that when we have two nearby cysteines in a reducing environment, right? So you guys took general chemistry, you guys are familiar with redox, right? So reducing systems are gaining electrons, oxidizing systems are losing electrons. So in reducing conditions, these sulfhydryl groups exist as unreacted thiols. When we push these two amino, these uh, two cysteines into an oxidizing environment, they'll actually oxidize and form a disulfide bond. So they're going to give up their 
ions and form a covalent bond between adjacent cysteines. So cysteines are going to remain reduced uh, in environments like the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is predominantly a reductive environment. Uh, what this allows cysteines to do in the cytoplasm is actually participate in oxidative signaling. Right? So those cysteines can be oxidized and reduced in response to different environmental stimuli, and that can constitute a type of communication within the cell. In the extracellular space, which is highly oxidative, you almost never find a free cysteine. It's, it's almost always participating in a disulfide bond. And I'm going to harken back again as a matrix biologist that when we find free cysteines, when we think evolutionarily about this, and we find free cysteines, meaning they're unreacted in the extracellular environment, the first question you should have is, that doesn't make sense. Why on earth, through evolution, would that be retained? When there's so much selective pressure due to this oxidizing environment to have it begin to participate, either participate in a disulfide bond or be mutated out throughout evolution. Okay, and so there's gonna be a particular case in the extracellular environment where that cysteine becomes kind of interesting. Um, and, and why it's, it's unmodified is, um, is, is something that's at the cusp of, of biology in that space. The other place that we can get oxidizing environment is in the interior of many organelles. And we're gonna talk about membranes and we'll talk about membrane structure. Uh, when you think about, uh, this is an, the interior of many organelles, organelles that are going to, to actually wind up releasing contents into the extracellular space, they actually look much closer to the extracellular space than to the intracellular space, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that, the evolution of why we develop such a complicated membrane structure um, in cells. Okay, so how do disulfide bonds then restrict protein structure? Uh, we'd love to show you uh, how disulfides impact hemoglobin, but hemoglobin doesn't actually have any disulfide bonds. So in this case, we're going to look at human insulin. Human insulin is actually generated from a single gene as a single polypeptide chain in its immature form. It's what we call pro-insulin. So I'll make a note here. Whenever you see you're reading a manuscript and it says, a pro-protein, like pro-collagen, pro-insulin. What the pro is designating is that that protein, some type of processing is going to occur to that immature protein in order to generate what the mature product is. In this case, uh, pro-insulin is proteolytically cleaved from one long chain into two chains. Of course, you can imagine, I have one long chain and I cut it, now those two chains diffuse away from one another. Right, so there we go with my protein. So what disulfide bonds are going to do in this particular case is actually help hold those two chains of the mature protein together. So it's going to do that in two different forms. One is it's going to hold the two chains together in what we would call an intermolecular bond, okay, between two chains, inter. Um, intermolecular bond. Within the same chain, that would be term, termed an intramolecular bond, okay? So intra-chain disulfide bonds, inter-chain, excuse me, disulfide bonds. And it's designating whether it's between two chains or within a single chain. All right. Are there any questions about how disulfide bonds might arise and how they might help begin to make protein shape, give proteins their shape? Okay. All right. You can ask questions after class if you. <laughs> All right. So we're going to talk now about ionic or electrostatic bonds. And I was going to make a note earlier, this, this lecture is really pretty simple. It's, it's four types of bonds the disulfide bond, the ionic bond that we're going to talk about, 
hydrogen bonds or van der Waals forces, uh, and hydrophobic interactions. That's pretty much it. Those are the dominant features, uh, the dominant forces that are driving protein structure. So this is number two. This is the ionic bond. Um, and ionic bonds involve the transfer. So you guys have, again, all had chemistry, so it's nice. Uh, ionic bonds involve the physical transfer of electrons between atoms. They are not sharing that electron. One is the giver and one is the taker, right? My five-year-old is the taker and I am the giver every single day. All right, so unlike disulfide bonds, which require a reducing environment in order to break, ionic bonds will tend to break in the presence of salt. Can anyone maybe give me an idea of why, make a suggestion about why salts might break ionic bonds? Hearkening back to your basic chemistry. Yeah. Salt itself are Yeah, exactly. So there are lots of ions to donate, right? And so if I swamp a protein with high concentrations of salt, I have all these ions that I can donate and they'll donate them and break these bonds within proteins. And so a lot of times when we're trying to manipulate protein structure, we actually titrate in higher and higher amounts of salt and try to unfold proteins in that way, okay? One of the best ways is urea. No. All right, okay, so somebody's gotta give up an electron and somebody's gotta take an electron. Uh, so who are those folks? So it really falls to both the basic, uh, the basic side groups and the acidic side groups. Remember that the basic side groups are those that are positively charged at physiologic pH. Who remembers what physiologic pH is? Yeah, 7.4, right? So if you're good about watching the pre-lecture, you know that the pKa for arginine and lysine is higher than physiologic pH, higher than pH 7.4. And so their pK is actually somewhere around 10. So at physiologic pH, they're protonated. Histidine is an interesting um, example where the pH actually comes into play as to whether or not it's gonna be protonated or non-protonated, right? Its pKa is hovering around six which means that at physiologic pH, it's predominantly in a non-protonated form. But, you know, again, when we start talking about uh, vesicular trafficking and different types of vesicles, it, when a cell is actually taking in material from its extracellular environment, it creates what's known as an endosome. And on those endosomes, it actually has protein pumps that start pumping protons into that space into that vesicle, which acidifies the interior of those little vesicles. And so you can very easily get the pH dropping to even as low as four uh, within those domains. And so now all of a sudden, histidine can become protonated in those conditions. The partner uh, in ionic bonds are the acidic side groups. Again, these guys, their pKa is hovering around two. So what that means is that at physiologic pH, these guys are deprotonated, uh, negatively charged. These would be aspartic acid and glutamate, or glutamic acid. All right, so how do electrostatics uh, facilitate assembly? Certainly within a single polypeptide chain, you can imagine how these ionic interactions uh, help to hold certain structure. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to take hemoglobin, go back to our protein of choice today, and look at hemoglobin. And if you'll humor me for just a minute, we're going to skip over secondary structure, and I'm going to jump right into a definition of what tertiary and quaternary structure are. Um, so when we talk about ter uh, tertiary structure, what we're really talking about is the three-dimensional structure of a single polypeptide-based protein, so a protein that has one chain, or in the case of hemoglobin, which is a tetramer, right? so there are four independent chains that come together, uh, it would be 
the three-dimensional structure of one of these subunits. So the alpha subunit has a tertiary structure. The beta subunit has a tertiary structure. When we talk about how the alpha subunit and the beta subunit come together, now we're in the realm of what we would call quaternary structure. So two independent proteins that come together to form uh, a single uh, functional unit. Okay? So what we're going to do with hemoglobin is we're going to split it in half. And we're going to look at one alpha beta subunit and the opposing alpha beta subunit. Right? So it's a tetramer with two alphas, two betas. If we split the protein apart and I color code your acidic and your basic residues, again, the basic residues being in red and these acidic residues being in blue, then what you can begin to see is if I crack this, what I'm doing is like an egg. I'm going to crack this protein up, out, and show you the, the, the interface. What you'll see, let's say, if we look at this domain, is that you can begin to see where these acidic residues are going to come into contact with these basic residues, right? And so these interactions between these two domains will actually help stabilize that, in this case, this macromolecular complex. Here's another region where we have complementary acidic residues with basic residues that help to hold this structure together. Okay, so this is just one example of how ionic bonds uh, and electrostatics uh, facilitate assembly. All right, so where electrostatics, if we're going to really understand uh, how these play a role, we need to uh, think a little bit about electrostatics and the isoelectric point. So we talked a little bit about pKa, right, which is the, you know, which is um, basically telling you how acidic a compound is, right? If the pKa is below it, the pH, right? So let's see, I'm going all sideways on this. So the pKa is going to tell us the pH with which that molecule is neutral, okay? So that's, I guess, the way I'll describe it. Um, so if we have acidic residues in low pH, those species are neutral. If we have basic residues, when we increase the pH, those residues become neutral. What the, oh, I, I always go the wrong way on that. What the isoelectric point is when we take the combination of all the uh, amino acids within the protein and look at the protein as a whole, the isoelectric point is the pH with which the entire molecule, all the positives and negatives, cancel each other out, and you have a neutral molecule, okay? That is the isoelectric point. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about secondary structure. Um, and we're going to talk about, uh, it's basically uh, the local folding that's driven predominantly by hydrogen bonds. And there are two different types we're going to tackle. One is what we call an alpha helix, and the other is a beta sheet. Okay. The first is that we'll tackle is, um, is alpha helices, but before we do that, I just want to review a little bit about hydrogen bonding. So to remind you, hydrogen bonding is an attraction between electronegative atoms on one molecule, uh, uh, between two molecules, excuse me, right? And so the hydrogen bond is uh, sh the sharing of electrons of an electron negative atom with an electron positive atom, okay? So these are inherently molecules, in this case water, that have what we call a dipole, right? Because Oxygen is uh, electronegative. It draws electrons away from hydrogens towards the oxygen, right? And as a consequence, uh, you get a, a denser electron cloud around the oxygen than the hydrogens. Those electrons can then be shared with a neighboring hydrogen uh, atom, right, in order to form this relatively weak bond. But it's, um, it's, it's strong enough when 
can think about, I always think about these things as Velcro. So, you know, each individual Velcro strand might be quite weak, but when you start putting multiple strands of Velcro together, you can get quite tight bonds. And so that's, that's the case of hydrogen bonding uh, in these protein structures. So just to reiterate, it's gonna involve some sharing of electrons. So you'd think, okay, well, uh, it probably makes sense that the side chains are participating in hydrogen bonding, right? We've got all these dipoles that are likely out there on the, on the side chains. But the interesting thing is that the hydrogen bonding is actually only occurring with the peptide backbone, okay? The reason it does this is that the oxygen associated with that carboxylic acid group that carboxyl group is electron negative, and the hydrogen associated with the amine group is your electron positive group. And so what you're gonna have is, you can imagine two polypeptide chains maybe going in opposite directions in the case of a beta sheet, and those chains come close enough that the peptide bonds themselves begin to participate in hydrogen bonding. The side groups are gonna help define what that structure ultimately looks like. I just wanna reiterate that. The hydrogen bonding in, in these secondary structures are between the amine group and the carboxyl group of the peptide backbone, okay? All right, so let's look at the alpha helix. Uh, alpha helices are um, these tight turning structures, right, where we're getting here, hydrogen bonding between that oxygen of the carboxylic acid group, the hydrogen of the amine group, right here and here, and they're causing this twisting action, right, this turn in structure. What's one other, maybe somebody can, what's another really obvious observation from this structure? Is there anything else that like really jumps out at you? Yeah. Yeah, all the residues, all the side chains are around the outside, right? So this turn is exceptionally tight, about four amino acids per turn. That's about four uh, nanometers, right? About 40 angstroms right there. So it's a very, very tight turn. And you can imagine if I have any kind of side group and it's facing the interior, now all of a sudden we get what's called steric hindrance, right? It's basically structural perturbation, a structural inhibition of this type of turn. So what you'll find with alpha helices is that the residues are always pointing to the outside. The other thing that I want you to um, take away is that the alpha helix is what we call a right-handed turn. Everybody knows what those are? What, what I mean by a right-handed turn versus a left-handed turn? All right, I'll, t I'll talk about it. So where's the end terminus of this protein? Someone, top or bottom? Top, okay, great. All right, so the amine terminus is at the top, the C terminus is at the bottom. So if I use my thumb of my right hand and I point it in the direction of end terminus to C terminus, the curvature of my hand is telling me the direction of the curvature of this helix, okay? So use a, it's called the right-handed rule. If my N is here and C is here, put my thumb in that direction and that tells me the direction of curvature, okay? Right-handed or right-hand? It's a right-hand helix, yeah. <laughs> Yes. The alpha helix. Yep. Yep. Okay. The other thing I'll point out at this slide is that you actually see two superimposed structural representations of this alpha helix, and this is where I want to talk about the different ways that you might actually observe structure when you're reading a paper. The first is what we call a ball and stick right, or an atomistic representation, which are these little atoms, right, except for the side groups. If 
we knew what these were. They would be out. Uh, they would be demonstrated. And so when you see this ball and stick, that's trying to tell you the positions of the actual atoms. A lot of times what you'll see is that when we have this these types of regular um, secondary structures like an alpha helix, and you'll see in a minute the beta sheet, a lot of times we'll do what's called a ribbon structure, right? And that's basically this representation of a ribbon that's showing you the basic shape of that protein, okay? And you'll see that here in, in a few minutes with beta sheets as well. All right, so hemoglobin actually winds up being a great example of a protein loaded with alpha helical structure, right? So this is a three-dimensional, this is a, what we would call a surface map. So you're only really seeing the surface of the protein. If we overlay a ribbon structure that's showing you inside the protein, then you see these loaded alpha helices, alpha helical structure within it, okay? Bless you, whatever that was. All right. All right, so let's talk about the second form of secondary structure, and that's the beta sheet. Again, hydrogen bonds between the backbone, the peptide backbone uh, of the protein, okay? So here, the hydrogen on the nitrogen and the oxygen on the carboxylic acid. Here, 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 here. All right, now, as opposed to the alpha helix, where my hydrogen bonds are occurring about every four, on every fourth amino acid, in this case, uh, so they're very proximal, right? They're almost my nearest neighbor uh, amino acids. In this case, you're getting two disparate parts of the protein that are coming together and forming hydrogen bonds. Uh, and so, in fact, you can, you can actually get a beta sheet forming from the N terminus of a very large protein with the C terminus of that same protein. If it wraps all the way around and comes into proximity, Right, with the N terminus, then you'll wind up, you can get um, beta sheets forming, okay? So alpha helices are formed between amino acids that are in very close proximity in their primary structure. That restriction is not the same for beta sheets. Does that make sense? Okay, a couple things to notice um, is that for one, the R groups always pointing up together, followed by down together, right? So in two amino acids that are participating in hydrogen bonding, their side chains are always pointing in the same direction. The next amino acids in the sequence of this beta sheet, they're both pointing down, right? So they're gonna alternate both up, both down, both up, both down. One of the reasons is that the side chains that are preferred in beta sheet formation are hydrophobic. Large aromatics, the large aromatic rings, and the aliphatic side chains are preferred in beta sheets. And so they're gonna come together. All right, I'm gonna ask a real quick question. So quiz part pre-A, where's the N terminus of this beta sheet and where's the C terminus? of this beta sheet. This one up here, sorry. Somebody take a guess. Use your gut. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. N terminus, C terminus? Yes. So, C terminus? This one's the N terminus? Yes. Why? Okay. Well, the R groups pointing up and down won't tell you much. Now their local position within the linear chain will. Did somebody else have an answer? I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just trying to get a couple. Yeah. An N and a C. Where? Which N? So here's two Ns. 
Is that right? No. And Yeah, yeah, so the hydrogen bonds here are paired N and C, right? Here's the carboxylic acid, here's the amine group. All right. So you're right, but not quite for exactly that same reason. When you usually ask this question, everybody says, oh, that's the C terminus right there, right? It's got a carboxylic acid hanging right off the end. It's like the very easy first impression answer. You look at it, you look for the carboxylic acid, bam, that's it. And that would be the wrong answer, right? I bring this up because we brought up this issue of thinking you know something, using a little bit of information, and then trying to extrapolate that to an answer, let's say, on a quiz or an exam. In this particular case, they're showing a longer protein, right, which starts way out somewhere else. And I'm going to give you two clues to remind you how to figure out what direction it is. Remember, the N-terminus, the amino acid goes N-terminus, alpha carbon, carboxylic acid. Look for that pattern in the nitrogen, the alpha carbon, the carboxylic acid. So in this case, what we can see is there's an N-terminus. You're right, there's the, there's the residue, right? So the residue, the side chain, tells us our alpha carbon. There's the amino, alpha carbon, carboxylic acid. So this is the N-terminus, and that goes to the C-terminus. It happens to be that this is the N-terminus, and it's going to a C-terminus. The other clue when you get a ribbon structure, it's really almost even more stupidly simple, is that the arrow points in the direction of the reed. <laughs> And so uh, we would probably not give you a ribbon structure. <laughs> we might actually give you an amino acid structure like this and, and ask that type of question. So you need to be thinking about it beyond just your initial context clues of, oh, there's a carboxylic acid. That's the C-terminus. Next question, right? Just be careful. All right. OK. All right. So a couple of examples of, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Sure, yeah. It's, yeah the, it's a little bit dark here. Um, so in this particular case, I'm looking at right here. This is an amino group. Just find any amino group, right? And then go to the left and ask if that's the alpha carbon, or go to the right and ask if that's the alpha carbon. If I take this nitrogen that's right here, and I go to the left, it, it's got this double bond with the oxygen. So that's telling you it's the carboxylic acid, right? If I go to the right, that carbon has a side chain on it. So that's my alpha carbon, right? So that's how I find out what direction I'm, I'm supposed to read, OK? Yeah? Are you still Uh, are you asking how that question would be phrased on a quiz or an exam, or is it more fundamental, sort of? I, yeah, it's a, this is just an example of where you can get tricked, right, in protein structure if you're asked a question like that, right? So if there's a fundamental understanding that you understand what the N-terminus and the C-terminus is, we want you to be able to begin to pick out those patterns, right? And, and see that, you know, this is the logic of a protein in to, to alpha carbon to carboxylic acid. I don't know what the structure would look like, but we would certainly, if we, if we actually ask a question like that, we'll, we'll direct it pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah, so you read in the direction of amino to alpha. Amino, alpha, carbon, carboxylic acid. So you read in this direction. And then here, pick out any amine group. Here's an amine group, right? If I go here, there's my R group. So that's the alpha carbon, right? So I'm reading in that direction, and I'm reading in that direction, right? N-terminus to C-terminus, N-terminus to C-terminus. 
We have no idea where this is in the protein, okay? Don't, don't get confused by that. It could be right up against each other or it could be very far apart. So for example, right? So here's a good example. Here's a beta sheet. This is superoxide dismutase one. It's comprised almost completely. It forms um, this, um, the, almost like this barrel structure that's based off of a number of anti-parallel beta sheets. So that's the other designation. This is what we would call anti-parallel because the N to C terminus is going in one direction and in the opposite direction. You can actually get parallel beta sheets where N to, terminus, uh, N to C terminus are running in the same direction, okay? Parallel versus anti-parallel. Here, these are anti-parallel beta sheets, and here it's a single stretch of amino acids, right, that goes up and then back, right? So those are this one small stretch of amino, of, of polypeptide where you get this. I'm gonna make this example here, it's a little bit confusing right in here, but this part of the beta chain, the, the beta sheet goes up and it actually comes way over here and now participates in a beta sheet with the back end of the molecule and then comes back up and then down, right? And so you can get like these sheets forming with multiple parts of the same polypeptide chain, right? Some are very obvious where they just make a loop and then come back and some meander off and then come back and participate in a beta sheet. Does that make sense? Yes, no, sort of. All right, sit with it for a bit. It will start to make sense. All right, and then here's another protein, uh, flavodoxin. I think I made a comment last year that Kevin would pick redox sensors and I would pick uh, extracellular matrix proteins. <laughs> but here's some good, two good redox proteins. Um, here again, this one actually having comprised of both alpha helical structure and beta sheet structure in order to create that tertiary structure, right? That full three-dimensional structure. The protein is then comprised of various secondary structures, right, that are, that are coming together. Okay. All right. So the last interaction that I want to talk about is hydrophobic. Hydrophobic interactions is the driving force of those aliphatic side chains to collect and minimize their surface area that are, um, that are interacting with water, okay? So hydrophobic interactions result from both a decreased mobility of water along hydrophobic surfaces. So if I have a long hydrophobic surface, the water along that surface is going to, uh, its mobility is going to be restricted. And so what this leads to is a decrease in entropy. And biology, nature, prefers more entropy, right? Sometimes the disruption of hydrogen bonding can, uh, excuse me, sometimes uh, these hydrophobic molecules can disrupt the hydrogen bonding between water molecules, okay? So in order to minimize both of these effects, what you'll get is, like in this example up here of, of pentane and water, two pentane molecules will come together in order to minimize their surface area as, uh, collectively uh, in order to maximize uh, the hydrogen bonding of the additional water and to minimize the restriction of water mobility uh, around their surface, right? So collectively, these, in this conf configuration, they have less surface area than when they're separated. And so that's a very, very strong driving force to try to minimize those interactions between hydrophobic moieties and water. And because of the high energies involved, these are the most important forces in driving protein folding and, and also membrane formation in cells. All right, so who are the players? These are gonna be all of the hydrophobic motifs, right? All of the hydrophobic side chains. So these will be the aliphatic side chains, valine, leucine, isoleucine, also includes methionine, uh, which is mildly hydrophobic. Uh, I point out that valine is very important for sickle cell, and we'll, we'll get to that here in, oh goodness, um, very, very shortly. <laughs> and then also all the aromatic side chains, which are not quite as hydrophobic, but still have hydrophobicity associated with them. 
tyrosine being um, perhaps slightly more um, amphipathic or, or hydrophilic, having a little more of a hydrophilicity um, uh, associated with it due to the, the OH group, the hydroxyl group. All right. Okay, so what does that look like in hemoglobin? Again, if we look at the hydrophobic interactions, in green are all the charged residues, right? Positive, negative. And what you'll notice is that they're all decorating the outside of this structure, right? All of these charged moieties love to interact. They're very hydrophilic, and they're going to interact with that aqueous solution that this protein exists in. If we look at the hydrophobic motifs, what you see is they're all in these little crevices, nooks and crannies, right, of the protein. And if we slice this protein open, you'll see even more, more of the hydrophobic residues pointing towards the interior of the molecule. So the hydrophobic moieties want to point away from the aqueous solution, and all the hydrophilic um, moieties uh, side chains will want to point to the outside. So this is a tremendous driving force in protein structure. Okay, wow, I'm going to make it on time. All right, so what is wrong with sickle cell hemoglobin? As I mentioned to you, it's a single point mutation, okay? It's a glutamic acid to a valine. It's a hydrophilic to a hydrophobic residue in position number six. That's it, that's it. It's crazy, right? All right, here it is uh, on the molecule. And what happens is that this is just a chemical reaction, right? It's, uh, it's just biochemistry. We've got a hydrophobic residue, and it wants to get away from the aqueous solution. And so what happens is that hemoglobin will begin to cluster together, form associations. All right, so if we do a little video here, here's, the valine, here's one valine there that's being hidden. Here's another one. So I hide one, and what's the problem with this? Got one three other valines now, these hydrophobic residues that are still pointing to the outside. So what happens is you get this multimerization of hemoglobin. So a soluble protein starts turning into a fiber. Right? And so you can imagine if I start taking a soluble protein that's supposed to be freely aqueous uh, right, um, and diffusing within uh, a red blood cell, and now I turn it into a rigid fiber. Now all of a sudden, as those fibers begin to form, here you can see, here's a hemoglobin fiber. It starts to impinge upon the membrane, right? It'll actually undergo, those of you that have mechanics of solids, mechies out there, right? You start getting bending of these rigid, uh, rigid fibers uh, as they begin to grow and grow and grow, right? And they begin to morph. Uh, the red blood cell from a disc shape into this sickle cell shape. You can see then they start to clog. They don't flow through small vessels the way they should. Uh, and this is primarily the underpinnings of, of this disease. This is the ideology of the disease. So what are the treatments? Fluids. Just dilute the blood, right? Dilute the impact of these sickle cells uh, on uh, vascular flow. Certainly pain medication, right? So these things are causing injury. These are basically physically obstructing vessels, causing vessel damage, causing inflammation, right? Um, the other is oxygen therapy. So you can imagine if I start, if my red blood cells are going from really good oxygen transporters to being burst, right? Uh, then I'm not transporting oxygen as efficiently. So these patients oftentimes need oxygen therapy. An interesting and I think um, right, not highly prevalent uh, treatment is the use of hydroxyurea. We talked about isoforms. One of the isoforms of hemoglobin is, is a fetal form of hemoglobin known as uh, HBG, so the gamma chain. Uh, it's actually downregulated uh, shortly following birth um, because we have these other isoforms that are um, better, um, better for transport from the lung. Uh, and when you give patients hydroxyurea, you start upregulating HBG. So now instead of having HBA, the hemoglobin alpha chain, 
coupling with the beta chain, now it can couple with the gamma chain and you can get uh, some type of functional recovery. And certainly blood transfusions, right? But you can imagine the lifetime of red blood cells is very short, and so these patients are always uh, on transfusion. I guess there's a question to the class. How would you guys treat sickle cell disease? Yeah. Ah, bone marrow transplant. Yeah. Um, I think you'd suffer from graft versus host disease, but uh, you know, I think replacing the um, hematopoietic stem cells is definitely an, an interesting place to go. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, so you could couple, you certainly can couple things where you pull bone marrow out, maybe even it's the patient's own hematopoietic stem cells, potentially engineer, correct the gene, right? Has anyone ever, yeah, go ahead. Well, so diabetes is, a, is not a monogenic disorder, right? So there's, that's much more complicated, but you're right. This is one of those diseases where you see all I have to do is make a single substitution in order to potentially regain normal function. Yep. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, so there are a number of groups that are using CRISPR, CRISPR-Cas9 systems, which I think Kevin's going to talk about, right, towards the end of the term. I, I think I'm going to attend that lecture because it should be pretty exciting. Um, so folks are using CRISPR-Cas technologies. It brings up ethical issues, though, as well, right? So you mentioned, you know, prenatal, right? So this is in, in utero. Um, you know, uh, I'll highlight my wife was a viral-based gene therapist. And this was like in the late 90s, early 2000s, this was the big question was, do you, if you actually could fix something in utero, what are, the, what are the ramifications ethically about changing that, changing germline, right, somatic engineering gets kind of creepy fast. So, all right. Okay, so, um, so why does it come out? This is my last little teaser, right, my last little, little pitch here. So why on earth does this population from West Africa, why did it develop this? And there's an interesting series of studies now, uh, this one being uh, pretty prominent, that shows that uh, if you have the sickle cell gene, one allele, all right? One allele where I'm getting an, um, one beta and one S mutation, will actually confer resistance to things like malaria, right? But not, I will not have all of the disorder associated with actual sickle cell disease. The problem is that if we've got this evolutionary pressure for this gain of function mutation to, to make us resistant to malaria, and now my mama has it and my daddy has it, and they get together and now I have both alleles, now I've inherited the recessive disorder and all of a sudden, my cells go from normal to sickle, sh sickle shape. So again, think about the evolutionary pressures on, on why these things uh, happen. Cystic fibrosis, there's actually a crazy theory out now that CF mutation is also a gain of function mutation because it makes your neutrophils hyperactive and able to fight off infection, but it also happens to do a lot of bad to your, so. All right, guys, um, those of you interested in these topics, uh, here are a number of investigators in molecular physiology and biophysics that you should look up. All right. We'll see you guys on Thursday. Be ready for the quiz. It'll cover the pre-lecture and this lecture.